All right, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the slight delay there, technical difficulties, but we seem to be over that today. But to welcome you to the March 12th joint meeting of the West Sherlock Subbasin and East Sherlock Subbasin Technical Advisory Committees, our joint meeting. Um, I'm the chair for the West Sherlock Basin, uh, Michael Cook, and Sarah Wolf is here from the East Sherlock Subbasin GSA. Why don't we start with introductions? That gives me time to check if we have a quorum. And then we'll kick off the meeting. So uh, when we start here this time. Jennifer Land, TID. Michael Cook, TID. Matt Beeman, Merced Irrigation District. Lacey McBride, Merced County. Oops. Actually, I have this. Merced County. Uh, Dennis Schultz, of Blake Cortez Water District. Mike Tietze, East Termox Subbasin GSA. Sarah Wolf, East Side Water District. Caitlin Bursey, Council for East Termox Subbasin GSA. And Christy McKinnon with Stanislaus County. Joshua Casas, the City of Series. Juan Ochoa, City of Modesto. Uh, Michael Clipper, TID. David Odom, Daenerys CSD. Michelle Harris, East CSD. Curtis Juritz, my home, our County Water District. Andrew Baldonado, Delphi CWD. Mike Pitt, City of Waterfield, for victims. Kevin Bono with the Turlock I count nine or 10 members of West Sherlock, which is a record. So <laughs> I can write this down, everybody. We have a quorum. So with that, at 2.04, I will call this meeting for the West Sherlock to order. And Sarah? We do have a quorum as well. So at 2.04, we'll call the East Sherlock GSA to a quorum or to order. <laughs> Wonderful. And we have a number of people you see joining us online. I mean, our consultant crews will probably introduce themselves as they speak. So. Let's get to item number three, public participation. This is the time set aside for members of the public to directly address the Joint Technical Advisory Committees on any item of interest to the public that is within the subject more matters jurisdiction of the Technical Advisory Committee. So you can speak now on general matters, or if you're speaking on a particular item, wait till the item is called. Do we have any public participation at this time? Okay, seeing none and hearing none, we'll go to the adoption of the minutes. So this is for the for both agencies. This is the meeting minutes of January 9th and also the meeting minutes of February 6th, our regular joint technical advisory committee meeting. So for the January 9th meeting, only action would be required from the West Turlock okay, the Basin you. because we were unable to take action at the last meeting. There you go. So the meetings were sent. The minute the meeting minutes were sent out earlier in the week. Do we have a motion from the West Turlock TSA to adopt the um, meeting minutes from January 9th from our regular meeting? So moved. Motion from Curtis. Do you have a second? Second. Okay. Second. Leandro. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay. Those minutes, the January 9th meeting, are passed by the West Turlock TAC. Okay, there you go. So item B is actually minutes from February 6th, and I didn't have a quorum, so I didn't really have a meeting. So Sarah, this is your item. Thank you. We did have a quorum, so we had a meeting and need to approve the minutes from January or February 6th. So if I could get a motion. I'll move. Thank you, Dennis. A second? I'll second. Uh, thank you. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Item number five, budget update, overview of revenue and expenditures for the West Turlock Subbasin, East Turlock Subbasin, and the joint account. Let's start with Michael Clipper. Okay. Um, let me start with the West uh, Turlock account um, for period ending uh, February 29th. We had $1,176,659.83. For the basin account for the same uh, time period, we had $791,086.49. Any questions? Questions from Michael. Ready up to date on the cash flow and stuff, Michael? I believe so. Okay, good. All right, carry on. Um, East Turlock does not have an update. Today I don't have that balance, but it's lower than the... <laughs> <laughs> On the West Sherlock. Okay. Any other questions on budget? Okay. Moving on to item number six. This is the main event. The water budget, subsidence, and groundwater sustainability plan third annual report. So review the draft annual report. 
um, all the sustainability indicators listed herein. This is for war to year 2023. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Liz Elliott of Todd Groundwater. So over to you, Liz. Okay, thanks, Michael. Hi, folks. Can you see my screen and hear my voice? Yes, we can. Great. All right. Um, well, thanks so much for joining today. Um, I'm Liz Elliott with Todd Groundwater. And um, we have two presentations for you today um, related to this year's um, annual report for Water Year 2023 which is due to the state um, by April 1st, just a few weeks from now. So I'm gonna start off um, and then Dominic is going to um, present um, results of the model and water budget um, uh, after me. So to get started, um, so at previous joint TAC meetings, we have presented results of the water level analyses for water year 2023, as well as uh, results of our water quality analysis. Um, so this presentation, my presentation is relatively short. I'm just going to be showing you some results that you haven't seen yet. Um, and that includes some analysis we did for reported dry wells in the subbasin. Um, an analysis we did for subsidence. And then at the end, uh, before I pass it off to Dominic, I'll just kind of go over the schedule with you for the rest of this month. So um, in each annual report, I think last year was the first one, this is the second, um, we have included um, a summary of reported dry wells uh, during the water year. Um, this information is from DWR's dry well reporting system. And during this water year, water year 2023, there were 14 reports of dry wells in the subbasin. Um, you can see two different colored dots on this map. There are green dots. Um, those are cases that were resolved and there are eight of those. So eight, eight reports of dry wells that were resolved um, and shown as being resolved by the department. And then there are six that are still open and are called outages by DWR. And those are the yellow, yellow, yellow dots with the crosses. Of the open outage cases, the yellow dots, um, five of the six um, indicated that the well was dry and no longer producing water, um, and one reported a reduction in water pressure. Um, there, of the 14 that wells that were reported dry this water year, um, there was information on, on well construction for about eight of them. And of these eight, all of them but one um, were pretty shallow. They were less than 100 feet deep. So we also did um, a little bit more uh, of, of a subsidence analysis this year than in past years. Um, and so this first figure I'm showing you is, is similar to what we've included in past annual reports. This is um, a map of the vertical displacement data um, based on DWR's INSAR um, data. Um, and this, so this is for water year 2023. And the orange colors show um, a negative vertical displacement. Um, and so, as you can see, throughout most of the subbasin, we have negative vertical displacement. Um, the, the lighter yellow color is between zero and negative 0.05 feet, which is 0.6 inches. And this is actually kind of within the, the measurement margin of error of the instrument. Um, but the darker orange colors, which you see in the in the west uh, western subbasin, and also kind of stippled throughout, kind of the center of the eastern subbasin and along the eastern edge of the subbasin, that's slightly greater ground displacement. Um, this is these are values of 0.1 to 0.05 feet, so it's between 0.6 and 1.2 inches of negative vertical displacement in these areas, and these are areas. The areas with the darker orange are areas that have been sort of consistent. We've been seeing this um, year after year. It's not a lot, but it's been sort of the, the, the areas where we're seeing it are consistent. And so this next figure will kind of illustrate that. So in our GSP, um, in the GSP, we included a map um, of the INSAR data between 2015 and 2019. So what this map is, is sort of an extension of that. So this map shows the cumulative vertical displacement from June 2015 through the end of this water year, September 2023. And what it shows is similar areas of the subbasin where we're seeing subsidence. Um, and the, the two um, 
areas with the most that we're seeing are in the western subbasin. One is um, south and southwest of the city of Turlock. Um, this area has sort of expanded and the magnitude, the cumulative magnitude is between about three and about three and a half inches of negative vertical displacement over this about eight year period. The other area is right here along the edge of the Corcoran clay, kind of near Delhi. Um, and this has um, a magnitude of about 4.2 inches of negative vertical displacement. So again, these two areas are, are, we're seeing consistent negative vertical displacement year after year. And, and this map shows that cumulative effect. So I wanna, the next couple of slides, I wanna kind of hone in and show you what's happening in these two areas in the Western Subbasin. And the first I wanna point out, there is a, there's a little triangle here that might be hard for you to see, but this is um, a GPS station. It's a, it's a Turlock GPS station. And this next slide shows data from that station. So this chart here shows um, data from 2013 through early 2024. The blue dots are the, the data that collected pretty frequently, and the red dots are an average by, by year of, of that data. Um, and so you can see the cyclic pattern, the ups and downs that happen almost every year. Um, and this up and down pattern is indicative of elastic subsidence. It's a seasonal pattern of elastic subsidence. Um, and, it's, and, and the scale on the left is in feet, so each point one foot, which is shown by the, by the uh, cross hatches, by the lines on the chart, uh, 0.1 feet is like 1.2 inches. So we're not talking um, a lot, you know, these seasonal short-term patterns are an inch or less of up and down that happen seasonally. But when you look at the, the whole chart um, over time, you can see sort of a declining trend. And so this declining trend over time, um, is indicative of inelastic subsidence, subsidence that isn't recovering. Um, and so the, the numbers that I've posted here on the chart are the, the, the average vertical displacement in 2013, which is about 0.023, and then in 2023, which is 0.187. And looking at the difference between those, it just shows that the average annual net vertical displacement was about 0.164 feet or about two inches. So two inches of negative vertical displacement or subsidence um, over time at this GPS station. And so now I wanna move on to this other, the, the next area. Um, and this isn't the area near Delhi, near the edge of the Corcoran clay. I'm showing you um, a hydrograph for um, MW6A. This is a monitoring well that was installed um, with Prop 68 funding two years ago. And so we don't have a lot of data. You can see on this hydrograph, we've got three data points from the spring 2022, fall 2022, and spring 2023. Um, we um, looked at the well log um, for that was developed after this well was constructed. Um, it was constructed with under the oversight of Wood Rogers. And we saw that the cork and clay at this location as it is at a depth of about 108 to 112 feet below ground surface. Um, I'm sorry, I think that should be 108 to 120 feet below ground surface. It's about 12 feet thick. Um, and so I've marked on this chart where the Corcoran clay is based on the ground surface elevation. And it's at an elevation of about 39 feet to 27 feet. And so you can see here, um, just with the limited data that we have, that the two spring measurements um, are below the top of the Corcoran clay. So groundwater levels, and, and this well is screened below the Corcoran clay. So the, the groundwater elevations during both spring events were below the top of the Corcoran clay. And we can see in the fall of 2022, the groundwater elevation was actually below the bottom of the Corcoran clay. So this explains um, most likely why we're seeing some subsidence in this area, because we're drawing down groundwater elevations below the top and below the bottom of the Corcoran clay and likely dewatering a portion of the clay, which is causing, likely causing the subsidence. 
And so we took this a little bit further. Um, we wanted to kind of look at what groundwater elevations were in this area of MW68A back in October, 2015. Um, in our GSP, we included a contour map for the Western Lower Principal Aquifer um, below the Corcoran Clay that was limited um, because there was limited data. And the data um, that we had at that time, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's basically these, these black dots, these wells uh, and contours along the Eastern edge of the, the, like close to the edge of the Corcoran clay. So we didn't have a lot of data at that time. But what we have done is, you know, since groundwater elevation data is, is now being uploaded to the, the Sigma portal and the monitoring network, um, EWR's monitoring network module, um, we're able to access data uh, uh, um, in adjacent subbasins. And so we have kind of um, embellished this map a little bit recently based on data in the Merced subbasin and Delta Mendota subbasin. And we're able to generate approximate contours. That's why they're, they're hatched, um, because they're approximate, because they're not based on data in our subbasin, they're based on data well, they're based on data in our subbasin near the Corcoran here, but we don't have data in this area. And we're basing these contours um, on the data that we have in these two adjacent subbasins. But based on these estimated contours, um, groundwater elevation at around MW68A at that time in October, 2015, was approximately likely about 30 feet. And there is a control point pretty close here, the, a measured point that's about 18 feet. So um, it is sort of reasonable to assume that this estimate is, is, is not too far off. Um, and so this 30 foot um, estimate suggests that even in October, 2015, um, and I'll go back two slides, at 30 feet, that elevation is within the Corcoran clay and below the top of the Corcoran clay. So it's likely that we have, in this area of the subbasin, drawn down groundwater elevations below the top of the Corcoran clay for several years. And so that's what this estimate has helped us kind of um, see and understand a little bit better, which kind of informs why we're seeing that hotspot that we're seeing for, for some negative vertical displacement in this area. So, that is all I have for subsidence. Um, I just, before I hand it off to Dominic and, and take questions before I do, um, I just wanted to kind of go over the schedule um, for this annual report. So this is our, um, you know, I'm showing here the, the meetings in, in blue on the calendar, blue circles and report deadlines in red. Um, and so today is our, our second joint tech meeting. Mm -hmm. and we, um, we provided the draft annual report to the tax. Um, I think it was actually a couple of days before March 1st and comments were provided uh, last Friday and this Monday. And so we're in the process of reviewing them and making revisions to the report. We will have a final report um, to the tax um, by the end of next week, the 22nd, and then we'll be ready to um, upload and submit it to DWR uh, the following week, the week of 25th before the April 1st deadline. So that is all I have. Um, before I pass it off to Dominic, are there any questions about um, subsidence or the dry wells that I that I went over? Any questions for Liz? Subsidence, dry wells, anything else? That's very good, Liz. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Let's hand over to Dominic. No. Okay, can everyone uh, still see my screen? Yep, hear me we got okay? it, Dominic. Yep, looks good. Excellent, thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as a supplement to Liz's uh, presentation, uh, I'm hoping to take the opportunity to go through um, effectively another part of our annual report, specifically related to the update of the C2V SIM TM model as well as uh, its use in developing the water budgets for our annual report. So as part of this uh, discussion, uh, my goal is to kind of walk you through a little bit of our process, um, effectively why we're doing this, uh, the types of data that we collect, uh, how we updated the model, and then eventually get to the results 
and really kind of have a discussion with the, with the general group on um, where we stand in 2023 when it comes to both the annual report in, uh, specifically, but then even, even more generalized, really kind of the, the status of the basin from a water budget perspective. So um, for anybody who's uh, either new to the group or is simply just less familiar with um, this, this process and the annual report itself, uh, in general, uh, I just wanna kind of give a couple brief background slides uh, as Liz already mentioned, uh, our third annual report is due to DWR on April 1st of this year. And uh, effectively, what an annual report does is it kind of brings our GSP effectively up to date to the point where we can discuss conditions and implementation of the, of the GSP process and of our management of the groundwater system. So this, uh, this, the third annual report or this for this year covers the 2023 water year, which would include uh, from October to September of 2020, or sorry, October 2022, September of 2023. So which then brings me to uh, some of the work that I've been working on over the past few months, or me and my team. And our goal is really to update the model to develop sub-basin wide butter water budgets and devel develop estimates of predominantly groundwater production and change in storage of the aquifer system. So in order to do that, uh, the model update includes a extension of all time series temporal data. Uh, we've worked a lot with the various agencies within the basin, as well as leveraging some state and federal databases to compile the best available data and to effectively extend our groundwater model through the 2023 water year. For your, we are going to go through a, point, uh, a verification or validation process. And so I'll be presenting towards the end of this uh, presentation, I'll present some of the um, model simulated hydrographs for streams and groundwater levels. And we can compare that to observed data for the sake of validation process. But I also wanted to make a note to let everyone know that while we are updating the model uh, with the it kind of the extension through the 2023 water year, we are not uh, recalibrating and we are not refining any parameters associated with the model. So it's simply a extension of the time period. So with that being said, let's get into the, uh, the fun stuff. So uh, over the past year, uh, what we've done is we've collected a lot of publicly available data as well as uh, resourcing the, the agencies throughout the basin to get a better understanding of what our operations are. So what this is is a, com a culmination of, pre of precipitation data, ET, land use, stream flow, and uh, available publicly available groundwater levels. Uh, we've kind of compiled all that information into kind of one big package, which is our integrated groundwater model. So to go through each of these individually uh, and kind of set the stage as far as what our water budgets look like and what and how we are kind of simulating the conditions within the basin, the first item is going to be, uh, we'll take a look at precipitation, obviously a major driver to our, our water budget is, you know, the water, the water uh, that is directly supplied uh, onto our onto our lands. So for the 2023 water year, what we've done, and you kind of see here is we've, 2023 was a very, very wet year. And comparatively to kind of our long-term average, uh, we see about 22 and a half, 22.4 uh, inches of precipitation within the basin. Now from a modeling perspective, it is important and we do capture kind of the spatial uh, variability through here. So that's kind of why I've included uh, this figure here to show you that you know, as per uh, most precipitation trends, we do see more, we see more precipitation falling in the foothills as opposed to the valley floor. And we see a slightly less uh, precipitation falling near uh, on the Western part of our basin, but kind of near the center, the center of the central, uh, central valley. And then going back to the overall volume, as again, I said, uh, this is the second largest year based on our model's historical period, uh, comparatively to, very similar, but not quite to the total precipitation that we experienced in 1997, but in general, a very wet year for the basin, um, which is giving us uh, some much needed repeat preve from our, for our aquifer conditions. In addition to precipitation, another hydrologic uh, and cl uh, climactic variable that goes into our model is temperature and evapotranspiration, really governing the consumptive use of water within the basin. So similar to uh, previous years, we capture both uh, daily, monthly, and annual temperature trends uh, from 
uh, publicly public sources from the Simma stations from a combination of within the Turlock Basin as well as the, the Modesto Subbasin as well. Um, because as a reminder, we share a model with the Modesto Subbasin. And so the two uh, basins are updated simultaneously to best simulate the interbasin conditions um, that we experience. So that temperature is then create uh, converted into an evapotranspiration. And so what I have here is just shown that is the uh, reference evapotranspiration value for uh, particularly focusing if you want to kind of look at the tail end of this, because this is a 2023 model update. I really want to draw most of your attention through this and a variety of the other slides towards kind of this last column here uh, that represents this past year. And overall, we can see that comparatively to the past few years, we see slightly lower evapotranspiration rates in 2023. Uh, this is predominantly is, is what we expect with a wetter year and is uh, consistent with what we see in some of our, in the previous hydrology. And this is most heavily focused uh, and related to uh, cloud cover and re uh, reductions in uh, solar radiation, which, re which in turn turns into less uh, general evapotranspiration and ultimately crop demand, in particularly some in the early months of the year. Okay, so then the another, next major factor that uh, drives a lot of the demand within the basin is our land use and our cropping patterns. So uh, for anybody who's familiar with the, the past few years and the update process that we've have, uh, traditionally we like to evaluate what our land use and cropping patterns are comparatively to the state resource. Uh, DWR publishes uh, a land use data set uh, developed by a company called Land IQ, and they provide parcel level uh, estimates of land use. Now, this is based on a mix of um, satellite imagery as well as some ground truthing. And so there is a, a degree of uncertainty associated with that. Um, and one of the major components that you can kind of see here, and this is again very consistent with what we've had in previous years, is the land IQ data set does vary. Uh, fairly significantly from some local data sets that we used and what we used in during the initial development of the G GSP. And that's why you'll see some of this kind of this, this drop here um, between the 2015, which is what the model went through the GSP as far as the updated land IQ data set. Now, because of this, in the past few years, as we've done, as we developed the initial, uh, the initial two uh, annual reports. Uh, the GSAs, has, GSAs have elected to not use this land IQ data set uh, in favor of maintaining the 2015 uh, land use and production, because, particularly because we know that we have not seen this level of decline in our production. And so with that being said, um, because we per the model is currently run through 2022, and again, this is a, just an update for this final last year, in order to not represent this very sharp decline in um, in our development, our, our agricultural and urban development, we have elected to maintain the same land use as the past few years. Now, with that being said, we have been working with the GSAs and there is an effort to do a more extensive uh, ground truthing and refinement of the land IQ data sets at a local scale. Because as I mentioned a few minutes, moments ago, uh, land IQ is a state developed data set. And uh, so we are going to go through the extra layer of uh, ground truthing of uh, uh, basically verifying, refining that data set to a more localized condition. Unfortunately, that data set is not available yet. And so our hope is to have that for the next annual update. But until then, we are uh, freezing land use development equivalent to 2015. So the fig effectively, our land use distribution will look similar to this chart he we have here on the right. So now that we have a, a rough idea of some of the data sets that go into the demand side of our water budget, uh, the next few slides is to look at what are, we what are we representing for supply side operations. So first and foremost, we'll take, we'll take a look at some of the surface water brought into the subbasin. For both surface water and eventually when we get into groundwater operations, uh, the, we are predominantly relying on local water agencies and purveyors to provide 
uh, they're measured or metered data to us. And so uh, within the Turlock subbasin, that is predominantly measured by Turlock Irrigation District, Merced Irrigation District, and some recycled water from the city of Modesto. In addition to that, we also have an estimate of data for riparian diversions. Now, since riparian diversions are not, uh, are not traditionally metered or reported, what we do for the update of the model is we are relying on uh, a state board database called eRIMS that provides, instead of providing metered uh, water supply data, that database is instead reflective of, their, of riparian water right holders. And so because of that, we are relying on the model to de determine demand. And then we use this database to, uh, de to represent their developed supply. So a combination of, of these four sources are what make up our surface water operations. But if we want to look at the volume of those surface op water operations, we can see here, particularly again in the 2023 water year, that indicative to the local uh, hydrology of this past year, we'll see, we see additional surface water supply being made available to, uh, to our growers. The bulk of this water is going to be made up of uh, TID surface water deliveries here in the blue color, but then because we are a fully inclusive integrated groundwater model, we also wanna make sure that we incorporate some of the interaction between the conveyance network and the groundwater system. And so because of that, we also make sure to estimate uh, streams, or sorry, stream and canal and reservoir seepage uh, for, for, turlo for TID, it says here in this orange color, as well as evapotranspiration, or sorry, evaporation from uh, those canals and conveyance systems. Similarly, we have the same uh, methodology applied to Merced surface water deliveries uh, along the Northside Canal, as well as evaporative losses in that canal system as well. Which then brings us to groundwater production. So groundwater production in the Turlock model is, is estimated, well, is represented in two ways. First, private pumping is estimated as being distributed across the entire basin and is utilized to meet demand that is not otherwise met by surface, by surface water supplies or agency-based groundwater production. So the other component we have is for agency pumping is we are actually modeling the specific wells, their depths, and each, each of these wells, their, the volume of water that is pumped in, from each of those wells. Ultimately, that water is delivered through a variety of uh, a variety of, variety of methods. Uh, and for example, some of the irrigation districts provide water, pump water both provide and provide it directly to their growers, as well as providing it that water through their surface water conveyance network. Both of those are represented independently, as well as mo most of the municipalities that we have here supply uh, urban water or for municipal and industrial uses um, with throughout their distribution network. Oops, excuse me. If we want to take a look at the overall groundwater production, what we have here is I've broken up into both agricultural and ur urban pumping. And uh, also, uh, I want to make a note that uh, the axes here are slightly different, but I wanted to make sure that we could uh, see the magnitudes of these figures. Um, but what I predominantly want to, to uh, draw your attention to here, again, again, focusing on the 2023 update, is consistent with operations and water supply. A lot of our agricultural our agricultural agencies have uh, much less groundwater production uh, than some of the drier years on record. And that is because they don't, we don't need as much groundwater to supplement our surface water supply. In addition to that, the, when it comes to looking at our urban agency production and operations, that is naturally more heavily driven by uh, population growth by urban demands, which are less variable to the local hydrology. So because of that, we see very consistent, uh, very consistent trends. There, you don't, we don't see the, the irregularity between years that we see in agricultural pumping, but we do see over the, especially over the past few years, we do see continued conservation efforts uh, being implemented both at the agency and homeowner level. And so because of that, we will see uh, addition, continued declines of our m &I water use. Okay, so uh, now that data gets fed, basically fed into an IWFM model, and over the next few slides, I'm going to show you some of the model results.
focusing on water budgets. We'll look at a couple hydrographs and then we'll discuss kind of how that is presented to DWR. So the first couple of slides we have here is what's called a land and water use budget. It's effectively the balance of all the data that I just showed in the past few slides. We have agricultural water, uh, both demand and water use here on the left-hand side. You can see the demand based predominantly on land use, evapotranspiration. We see that and irrigation um, components of irrigation methodology uh, being uh, uh, highlighted here in the kind of this light green color. And then that demand is met by a combination of surface and groundwater. So what we have here is surface water in the blue and groundwater in the gray color. Again, this is for the subbasin as a whole. I'll get into each GSA in a, in a moment. So for the basin as a whole, uh, similar to the, uh, the, you know, a lot of the input data that I just discussed, in general, we have slightly lower demand over the past, comparatively to the past few years. This is predominantly due to reductions in uh, natural evapotranspiration because as I mentioned earlier, uh, land use is consistent over the past several years. And so the major variable that is driving that is going to be uh, evapotranspiration and uh, precipitation, right? So we have more precipitation, we have less evapotranspiration, which overall means less demand comparatively to the past few years. The, the offset of that is we have a the combination of surface and groundwater operations, uh, as we expect with a, uh, with a wetter year, we have more surface water available, slightly less ground and uh, slightly less groundwater use to meet that demand. On the other hand, when it comes to urban, uh, our urban supply, as you can see here, effectively all of our uh, urban water use is being met through groundwater production. And so that demand, which is based on a combination of population reported per capita water use and the agency records that we pr uh, provided a few slides ago, we kind of see the overall use of uh, urban and MNI use, which I was uh, which may I add also includes private domestic groundwater use. So then, if we want to take a look at each GSA independently, uh, on the western side of our basin, we see a uh, more predominantly surface water focused uh, use, uh, being that being that the vast majority of the Westerlock subbasin GSA is a combination of. TID and riparian water users, we see mostly surface water supply with some groundwater use, as but overall the same general trend from the basin. Similarly, in the west is where the vast majority of our urban and MI use is, and so will this be very consistent to the basin totals. In the east Turlock subbasin GSA, we see a little bit of that, a little bit of an inverse. We the general same general trends with overall agricultural demand. Again, reduced uh, more precipitation, reduced evapotranspiration means our demand goes down a little bit. And but on the other hand, uh, comparatively to the west eastern subbasin is a predominantly uh, groundwater dep dependent uh, GSA with some surface water supplied from Merced Irrigation District. And similarly, as I mentioned, uh, the most of the MNI use in the basin is on the west, and so we have uh, only minor uh, private domestic groundwater use in the eastern basin. So then the next part I'm hoping to do is we would like to build, effectively build the groundwater budget from you. And the first major component that we're going to have here is what we call an operational budget. This is the combination of our water use that we just spoke to, specifically looking at groundwater production, water coming out of the uh, of our aquifer in the, the negative direction here, right? So we are uh, negative values are going out of the aquifer. Uh, and what goes into the aquifer system here on the upper hand is predominantly going to be a combination of deep percolation and uh, uh, the mix of, of recharge in the system. So this is canal and reservoir recharge. Uh, effectively, how much recharge is the basin seeing uh, directly related to uh, conveyance of surface water. And so similarly, uh, as kind of indicative to the previous charts that I had, Overall, uh, throughout the basin, we have less groundwater production uh, in 2023 comparatively to our long-term trend. And being the very wet year that it was, we see a, a significant increase in deep percolation due to local hydrology, precipitation, infiltration of precipitation, as well as fairly consistent uh, canal and reservoir recharge, although it does increase slightly. So then overall, we okay. see our, our net recharge in the basin here on the right. The net recharge is effectively the balance of these three major components from an operational perspective. And so uh, particularly in 2023, we see that overall we have a, uh, we are a net contributor operationally to the groundwater system. 
if we want to take a look at that for again from each GSA, we see very similar trends because the West Western GSA is uh, more surface water oriented. We see a uh, little bit less well, overall groundwater use, more uh, recharge, both from uh, a combination of precipitation of surface water and groundwater, applied surface water and groundwater uh, in the form of deep percolation, as well as canal and reservoir recharge. And then over here, we see a kind of a significant impact to the net recharge of the Western GSA. Looking at the Eastern GSA, a very kind of similar uh, relationship here. Again, reduced groundwater pumping, uh, a increased uh, deep percolation, uh, but due to the balance of surface and groundwater use, we see the impact here of deep percolation uh, is not as significant as we're seeing on the Western areas. And overall, from an operational perspective, the East Turlock GSA uh, is still a net extractor from the aquifer system, although again, comparatively to uh, past couple years, particularly, but even our long-term trends, we are um, less than normal. Okay, so uh, now to take a look at the uh, total groundwater budget. Uh, this is kind of what it all boils down to. Um, so if I, again, I'll point out a couple items here. Again, uh, the past couple slides have shown you the, the green deep, deep percolation, gray and groundwater pumping, and this purple color for our canal and reservoir recharge. Those make up our operational budget. What gets built on top of that is a couple other components that are related to kind of the, the local hydrology of our, of our system and our sur surrounding conditions. Principally, that's going to come to a couple major components. That's going to be our stream aquifer interaction here in the blue. We can see uh, both as a that, that stream aquifer interaction both has been a net feeder to the stream system, as well as more recently, we are being a the stream system has been feeding the groundwater system, has been recharging the groundwater system um, on a kind of net balance to that as well as subsurface flow from adjacent areas. Uh, this is flow that is coming from the Modesto, Delta Mendota, or Merced subbasins. And you can see here that the Turlock subbasin is a net contributor, or sorry, excuse me, a net receiver of, of subsurface groundwater flow from the, base, the surrounding basins. And so we can see that, that trend continuing throughout the entire historical period. And then the balance of all those factors here is what, it, what is represented in this orange color, which is the change in storage. And this represents the change of groundwater in storage, which I know is, in, uh, is a little bit of, um, a little complex, but overall the change in storage in the basin is a, uh, we, are, we saw this past year in 2023, a net increase in storage of 251,000 approximately. <clears throat> And so, um, and so the only component, though, the reason why I say I wanted to point out that it's, it's um, where the number may not uh, conceptually match this this figure here, right? Is because, <laughs> is the uh, orange color here? This as this since this represents the change of groundwater made available from storage. Uh, this is a net. This is a negative balance in the figure. Um, but I would, that's why I wanted to add the clarification that our overall change in storage is a positive uh, 251,000 acre feet. And so we, that is kind of the culmination of our operations as well as the hydrologic features around us and the di those dynamics. Okay, okay so then the last uh, major component here uh, before we get into our validation step as far as model results is one of the major components that as far as specific to the annual report and DWR's reporting is that they request that we provide um, effectively heat maps for pumping and change in storage. And so for the next, over the next five slides, four slides, um, I'm going to be, I'll be kind of walking you through each of those, showing you both where we anticipate or where the model simulates um, some pumping occurring throughout the basin as well um, as what the distribution of our storage looks like across the entire subbasin. So if we're gonna start from kind of similarly to the past couple of slides, looking at our operational conditions. Uh, first, the, the distribution, the spatial breakdown of where groundwater pumping has occurred in 2023. Uh, this effectively reflects much of the uh, conversation just up, up, until, up until this slide. 
as we expect, we see uh, more pr groundwater production occurring in areas where um, effectively where we where we would expect to see it. We know that the East Turlock Subbasin GSA and throughout most of that is a groundwater dependent agricultural area. And so because of that, to meet that uh, demand, they are, they are relying on groundwater pumping. And so because of that, we see increased groundwater supply being met on the Eastern parts of the basin, comparatively to the Western parts of the basin where they their agricultural demand is being met with surface water supply with some groundwater pumping. That's why we'll see, see um, some less less groundwater pumping overall in the West uh, on a unit basis. Com uh, but in addition to that, we will also see a couple uh, hot spots throughout the basin here. That is a um, you'll see here, for example, this is the city of Turlock. We have some series as well as some of the other municipalities, and so we are capturing kind of the distribution of some of the urban uh, urban groundwater use as well as uh, agricultural use. So that's why you can see some of these uh, hot, hot points as being kind of the combination of those two. And so overall, our, our long-term pumping for 2020-23 kind of effectively ref reflects that, right? We see we incorporated a lot of about 35,000, 30, 35, 36,000 acre feet of ag agricultural pumping, predominantly by TID, although there is a couple MID wells. There is also uh, ag, there is private agricultural pumping in the magnitude of approximately 293,000, again, uh, distributed throughout the basin uh, for in both GSAs, although more heavily on, on the east. In ur urban agencies, uh, again, this is where if we have pumping per well, those are distributed to be total of about 30,000 acre feet, as well as private domestic or de minimis use of, of 4,900 or about 5,000 acre feet there, bringing our total groundwater pump production estimated in 2023 to be 363,900 acre feet. So then if we want to look at the kind of a similar thing, if we want to look at the distribution of our where our change in storage is occurring, um, if you again, if you remember that the overall, uh, the subbasin actually I'll kind of highlight it down here, uh, the overall the subbasin at about 250-ish thousand acre feet of increased in storage. But if we want to look at where that is uh, distributed spatially, we, we have uh, modeled that and we can take a look at that through a combination of things. But what we're kind of the first step here that I'd like to present is, uh, and what we have to report to DWR is the change in storage by principal aquifer. And so what we've done is we've broken each of the three major principal aquifers as well as the overall subbasin. And so we'll kind of walk through that uh, spatial breakdown here. So in the Western upper principal aquifer, we see about 154,000 acre feet of increased storage. Now the combination of that is going to be the balance from our operations, particularly we have, you know, we have, uh, depercolation and infiltration associated with our applied water as well as precipitation being offset by groundwater production. In addition to those components, we also have our stream aquifer interaction, as I mentioned earlier when we looked at the groundwater budget. We saw that the Turlock Subbasin is a net receiver of uh, water from the stream system. And so that's most of what you're seeing here. You see some of these higher values um, along, particularly along the river system, because that is when we are uh, we are seeping more water from the river system and re uh, increasing our groundwater levels uh, associated with that. Then if we want to take a look at the lower western principal aquifer, again, this is deeper. So this is more operationally more operationally focused and there's less, less connection, to, at least there's not a direct connection to the river system. And so we don't see quite the level of recharge from the river system. Although I will add the clarification that uh, sub Corcoran, we, there is still a transfer of groundwater, uh, groundwater through the Corcoran, although it is muted because it is a confining unit. And so, but we, uh, there is a but that additional flow, that additional vertical flow from the upper principal to the lower principal aquifer, uh, we see a net increase of about 29 or 30,000 acre feet of overall storage throughout the Western principal, Western lower principal aquifer. And then when it comes to the Eastern principal aquifer, we see about 67 or 68,000 acre feet of net increase in our storage. Now that distribution is a combination of both uh, increasing uh, storage and increasing water levels uh, throughout, we can kind of see the, the far Eastern sections as well as along the Merced and the Tuolumne rivers, uh, indicative to that stream 
stream aquifer interaction, as well as some decline in our groundwater storage through uh, some of the central to north central sections uh, of the eastern principal aquifer. And so the and then the net of those, the kind of the 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 sum, the total, is a picture kind of 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 the entire subbasin, kind of the co the combined upper, lower, and the eastern uh, principal aquifer. We can see that in general, uh, we see that we do have that increase of about two hundred fifty thousand acre feet, uh, but there are still areas where we will see declines in uh, storage as well as declines in water levels, um, particularly again on this kind of this north central section here, as well as um, around maybe a little bit west of the city of Turlock. Is there a question or? No. Oh, keep going, Dominic. Okay, okay. cool. So that's uh, so the last, last phase I have. And then before, and then I'll open it up the table for plenty of questions is uh, we'd like to do kind of the validation stage of, uh, of our modeling. Uh, every time we want to make sure we uh, understand and can quantify uh, the accuracy of the model. And so the, the major step for that is to evaluate conditions, particularly in 2023, as we relate to our hydrographs uh, throughout the basin. And so uh, at this time, I'm going to effectively go through uh, kind of from approximately from west to east. I'll give you just kind of an example, some of looking at some of our monitor monitoring wells throughout the basin uh, and give you kind of an idea of the how the model is simulating our conditions here in this blue line, as well as uh, some of the observation data uh, so that we can see both uh, what we're what's occurring in real life as opposed to what the model is representing. And then you can see I've also included here uh, a representation of our MTs, NOs, and intermilestones as well. If they, I guess our intermilestones, uh, for example, here doesn't exist. And so there is, uh, so there's not a line there, but in general, you can see kind of uh, relatively kind of how we're doing. So uh, pr uh, predominantly, as I kind of go through these, you can kind of, if you'd like to, you're welcome to, you know, kind of get a, uh, a general idea of how a given well is performing, uh, how well we're simulating conditions in a given area. Uh, but mainly I really wanna focus uh, most of my discussion at least on the 2023 water year and the kind of the last couple uh, observation points and how the model's responding, right? Because we do know that in general, the basin is increasing. Uh, we have a few areas where we're still seeing some water level decline. And so I wanna make sure that the, both, what the model simulating reflects what we are observing uh, in the real world as well. So similarly uh, to, uh, to the couple of previous slides when it comes to kind of the Western part of the basin here, as kind of a, a representative kind of in the, just the, the mix, the middle of everything, uh, we can see that in general, we have we had some water level decline over the past few years, particularly uh, we had two critically dry years um, in 2021 and 2022, but then we see some level, some degree of recovery in 2023, right? So again, we're focused on that trend. We see, we want to see the shift from critical from critical operations to uh, wetter conditions. We want to see that rebound, and so that is what we are seeing here uh, in those last couple of years, both simulated and observed. A little bit further south, uh, we have a little bit uh, shorter period of observed data to measure against. But again, we kind of uh, we track at least the simulated conditions. We track fairly reasonably, and we see a little bit of a rebound. Uh, we don't necessarily see. Uh, a lot of impact uh, to conditions throughout the past few years of observed data. Um, but again, similar to a lot of our discussions on modeling operations is, um, you know, looking at the basin as a whole rather than any kind of give it specific well. So then uh, moving along a little bit, a little further east again, back to the north kind of here between the cities of Ceres and Turlock, uh, we, you know, the we are, model is following observed data fairly well. And again, in the 2020, you know, 2022, 2023 conditions. Again, we see that rebound uh, based on our increase of, of water availability within the basin. Similarly here, um, we can kind of see the trend. Again, I know in, uh, in this specific instance, so we see a little bit uh, greater overdraft being simulated by the model, at least in this very localized condition. But um, in again, drawing your attention to conditions throughout the 2022-2023 uh, 2023 period, we see both in the observed data as well as the simulated information, we see a little, a similar trend, uh, even if they are ultimately a slightly uh, different uh, absolute groundwater levels. And then again, when it comes to uh, looking a little bit further to the east, again in the north, uh, we see kind of a general generalized uh, continuation and following of the trend. A continued long, kind of a long term, uh, over the past thirty or so years, uh, we see a general decline in water levels, um, and then again, when, as we kind of get to the last few years, a very kind of a consistent, uh, consistent decline, although there is kind of some rebound. 
Similarly, a little, a little bit more centralized to the uh, center part of the Eastern GSA. Again, continued decline. Uh, this kind we don't have, I don't know if we're missing a data point on the observed data. Uh, we don't see a lot of recovery here, um, and, but again, you know, it, that is represented again in the model, kind of just a, a consistent, uh, consistent trend uh, without significant uh, recovery in this case. And again, then, then along the kind of closer to the Merced River, we see conditions. And again, I just mainly wanted to highlight the uh, the contributions we have from the stream system to our aquifer conditions, and because of that we see a much uh, a much greater increase uh, due to the whole hydrology, the, the volume of water that's in the river system and the stream aquifer interaction, we see a fairly significant increase in water levels uh, in the 2022, 2023, or sorry, from 22 to 23 uh, conditions. And again, the model is representing that, uh, that as well. Similarly here, a, a little bit further away, but again, wanting to highlight that impacts of the uh, stream stream system because comparatively to some of the other areas um, in the, you know, again, in that Northern Eastern section is we see that we again, see that recovery um, mainly, you know, are heavily contributed from uh, the river system. And again, I think this is the furthest East uh, figure that I have. If we kind of go to the fur furthest Eastern uh, high, uh, monitoring wells, we have uh, kind of looking at the conditions again, a little bit further away from the river system. And so because of that we see, um, we don't see a lot of recovery uh, comparatively uh, to areas where there is more water uh, or there um, stream system, stream water or recharged uh, surface water. And so because of that uh, we see a little bit of a leveling, but uh, no significant recovery uh, in this past year. And that's all I got. So uh, are there any questions? And I am happy to go dig back through this if anyone has anything they would like a second look at. Um, otherwise, Dominic, I can open the floor. Dominic, this is one with the city of Modesto. Uh, so I got a question. There was some information that Liz showed on one of the uh, slides where it showed kind of like the hot spots, and I think it was what, monitoring well 68A or well 68A. But then on one of your slides where it shows where it's where it's recovering, where you know it has green and, and, and so forth. I'm just kind of wondering how how that could be green, you know, that we're recovering when when it's when it's the hot spot. Um, so I guess I'm I'm trying to understand, you know, that <clears throat> that information from what Liz showed on that one slide and then what you were showing as far as you know the uh the basin recovering in that area when when it's considered a uh, it was considered a hot spot. Absolutely. So uh, first and foremost, I want to kind of at least address um, the nature of the regional model and the kind of the conditions and the resolution available. Um, kind of effectively what you're seeing here versus the lo very localized conditions you'll see at any specific well, right? So there is going to be a, a degree that is of very localized conditions if there is declined. Um, Declined water levels. I don't know. I don't know if Liz can speak specifically to that well, because um, okay. unfortunately, I, I don't have that specific well to kind of throw up for you, um, just to show you the comparison. But um, and I guess is is that model is your model based on Liz's, you know, three dots where they, you know, that's all the information that they have where it shows it's green, but it, in reality, it's not. I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm trying to, you know. Well, uh, if I could jump in a couple things. One is that the, the, I think the slide that you're showing, Dominic, is, is of the whole subbasin. Mm -hmm. And in the west, that would include the western upper and the lower heat map, right? So the combination. So if you go, could you flip to the western lower map? Okay. So this western lower map shows um, in that area, yes, that it's slightly green, um, which is a positive change in storage. I'm going to share my screen just so you can see that hydrograph for 68A. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can, Liz. Okay. So in, in, um, so again, we don't have a lot of data for this well, right? We only have three data points. We have, uh, spring 2022, um, fall 2022 and spring 2023, but during water year 2023, right? Which is the fall 2022 to spring 2023, we're actually, increasing groundwater elevations there. So there is actually a, I mean, it, so that is an area where we're seeing a positive change in storage. Um, but at, with this well, we, we can see that the groundwater elevation is still slightly below the top of the clay. 
um, top of the Corcoran play in, in spring 2023. So this is actually consistent with that, that uh, heat map for the Western lower showing a slight positive change in storage. Because I mean, didn't you, wasn't, wasn't the subsiding something like, like two inches, six inches or something like that or something of that nature? Oh, that? I mean, over, I'll, I'll go backwards. Um, I mean, over this eight year period from 2015 to 2023, it was four inches in this area. That was the, the highest amount was about four inches. This this very dark, dark blue little patch in the middle. Um, but the hydrograph, so, so this change in storage map that Dominic was showing was just for water year 2023. It's not a cumulative from 2015 to 2023 map. So I think that's, that's there. But, go ahead. Is the, I'm thinking the other concern you mentioned is it's inelastic subsidence, right? So once the Corcoran dries out, even if water levels go back up, that won't rehydrate and, you know, force elevations back up again. Is that that's, the bigger that's, concern? That's the bigger concern, yes. And that's what's being shown on this chart here. Inelastic means that the, the, the clay grains have actually collapsed slightly because they were dewatered. Um, over time. And um, so that's not going to regain. Um, what regains is the elastic, that seasonal fluctuation that you see, the up and down of the ground surface as as you, you know, with, with the seasons. And you can see uh, the seasonality, kind of the low points tend to be in the summer, you know, when it's hottest, when you're pumping the most. And then the high points are the beginning and the end of the year. Um, so it's consistent with what you would expect with the season. So so you're right, what you said, Michael, it's um, the inelastic is what we're, we're concerned with here. So the long-term management solution is keeping water levels up as high as we can, is that solution? It, it's, it's keeping, for subsidence, it's keeping water levels above the top of the Corcoran clay. You don't wanna dewater any part of the clay because clay is very, this, this the solid clay unit is, is it, when you dewater, it's very susceptible to collapse, um, which, <coughs> excuse me, causes subsidence. So, <coughs> so what would be the volumetric amount that where doesn't drop the below the Corcoran clay at, at some point, right? Where, where it doesn't recover or, or it has time to recover. I mean, if, if all this pumping is, is occurring at one time, so you're asking what volume of pumping is acceptable that won't cause subsidence? Right. Right. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer there. Um, I, I think it's just a matter of keeping an eye on water levels in these areas of the Corcoran to make sure that they don't drop below the top of the Corcoran clay. Um, because um, we know that the, the Western principal aquifers are the most vulnerable to subsidence because of the Corcoran clay. And that is true throughout you know, the Central Valley. Um, Subsidence is happening when uh, the most significant subsidence is happening when the Corcoran clay is being dewatered, when groundwater elevations fall below the top or the bottom of the Corcoran clay. So I think I, I don't I don't have a volume answer for you. I think it's something that um, you know it's a reason why we measure water levels uh, throughout the subbasin, and, and, and it's particularly important for subsidence to measure them in the western principal aquifers aquifers and here along the edge to make sure that our water levels are staying above the top of the Corcoran. So we just need to keep an eye on this in the future. So Liz, um, the, the tough nut on this well, on other tough nuts, is <laughs> um, you, you estimated that the 2015 groundwater levels were actually already below the top of the Corcoran clay. So I mean, in a sense, you could argue that well, you're 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 not required under Sigma to correct anything that occurred as of 2015, but subsidence can be latent, right? So uh, that's this is a this is a tough one. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right about that. Um, you know, and again, these these contours are estimates um, from 2015. Um, I'll flip to that slide again. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, we're not responsible for pre-sigma implementation, right? Which is which when the law was passed. Um, but if subsidence is happening, there's a latency to it. And we know, you know, that DWR is going to start 
looking closer at at all subsidence, you know, throughout um, the valley and throughout California. So we know that we're going to be the subbasin and and all subbasins are going to be um, under more scrutiny by the department for for any subsidence information. So Liz, is this a good up good item to put on the agenda for our meeting with DWR that's coming up regarding the incomplete letter we got about our GSP? I think they mentioned subsidence in the in the letter, right? Oh yeah, they do, and and you know they they would like to know um, part of the analysis and uh, is is what is what are the effects of lowering groundwater levels to the IM levels at the wells with IMs on other sustainable um, sustainability indicators and subsidence is one of those that we need to look at. So because yeah, Mike and and Juan both made good points, might be something to follow up on in terms of what what do we need to do or what can we do. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. We need to we need to look into this further. Liz, do you have figure 316 from the uh, tables that you provided us the draft GSP? Because that shows really a lot of the contours that even some were some, you know, the groundwater contours were some overlap into the other right near the near the 68A. From the from this annual report? Yeah. Yeah, I can I can open that up. Hold on, bear with me. Okay. This one, is this the one you're talking about? Yeah. Yep. I mean, so, that really, that really shows, I mean, it, it you know, like say a, a picture's worth a thousand words and you yeah. can really see the influence there. Yeah, and, what, and and if I'll flip to the next figure of the Western lower, just to show you the location of MW68A. Again, MW68A is in the lower principal aquifer right yeah. here. So if I flip back, it's right here, very close to ETSGSA 24. Um, so yeah, you can. There isn't. There's. We can see that that the Kona Depression um, is influencing that area. I think it, it's it's not premature to mention because we've said it um, that I think that a good way to deal with this in the GSP update is to develop an action plan because you know we clearly need to demonstrate that we're taking it seriously. So. Um, you know, I just wanted to put that out there because we we need to talk about it. Yeah. No. Yes, I think you're right. And and you know, and it's and it's also something that we need to think about during the five year update um, in terms of the sustainability indicator for subsidence. Um, do we keep it at groundwater levels or do we start looking at rates of of subsidence as as the indicator? Um, and that's just something that we'll we'll be thinking about during that during that effort. And just just uh, to, to add to it, um, the the TIE uh, is developing survey um, benchmarks throughout our county system, and so we're fast tracking those areas that are of concern based on the the cumulative subsidence map. To be able to have that information to help inform what may be happening throughout um, the, the western portion of of the subbasin. So over time, we'll have a better means of, of monitoring not just one uh, GPS point, that blue dot near um, the city of Turlock, but throughout the canal system, which transfers or traverses the, the entire West. So, so that should be helpful um, mm -hmm. on a long-term basis. Uh, we don't have that right now. <clears throat> yeah, yep, that will be very important. Sorry, I just realized I had the cover and my camera closed. <laughs> You know, it would be nice too, and I it was kind of my one of my comments is of that figure three sixteen. If you can kind of add the Modesto uh, sub basin, the the contours just to kind of show, you know, what's happening up there, since you guys already have that information. Yeah, I mean, we'd be happy to do that. Um, we we you know we did use um, the data, and I mean, we kind of contoured both sub basins together um, because it helped us understand what was happening at the river boundary. Um, and so, sure, we can put those lines on the same map. I think for the annual report, it's appropriate to show this, but I mean, we'd be happy to produce a map that shows, you know, both subbasins and the contours in both. Um, so you can kind of see what's happening across that boundary and how they relate to each other. Sure. Yeah. That's all I got. Thank you, Liz. Sure. Thanks, Dominic. Thank
Any other questions from the group? That's very detailed, Liz and Dominic. Thank you for that. I mean, that really does a good snapshot for us and maybe take back to our, you know, our elected officials to let them know what's going on this moment in time. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thanks. If I remember correctly, Liz, I don't know if we can go back to the original slide, kind of the, the, the timeline to get the annual report in. You had like yeah. a little schedule there. Do you want me to go back? Want me to share my screen and show that again? That'd be great. Yep. Okay, can you see it? Yep, we can. Okay. Yeah, so um, um, comments were provided by the GSAs. Thank you for reading it and providing comments. I know the, the timeline has been short um, and we are um, in the process of reviewing and, and we'll be revising the report and we will um, send out a, a final report by the end of next week, the 22nd. Sounds so that's, good. that's the next step. Any questions about the timeline? So if we, me, Jennifer, or Debbie send an email around asking for input or comments or whatever else, please, recognize how timely your comments have to be so we have to keep moving on this. I think the key is on any state report to get it in on time. And if we have things to work on afterwards, we'll do that. But I think we've got a good report already. Let's get it finished up and move on because we do have a lot of work to do with the um, with the revisions to the GSP. How's that coming along? Are we on track? Yeah. Terrible. No. Um, we have been working on that. Um, we're getting there. Um, Maybe we can do that. We have under item seven, GSP revisions. Maybe kind of cover it at that time. But no, I think we're moving in the right direction. Honestly, Juan, we'll get there. It's just it's a lot of pressure to get a lot of stuff done. That, that's when the best work comes out, when you work under the pressure. Yes. <laughs> right. So item number six, we do have an action item um, for the West and East Herlock Technical Advisory Committees to approve the third annual report. Um, you seen the, the basic concept we sent a draft around this will be a time to recommend approval of that um subject to any minor revisions we might have to do over the next week or two so with that do I have a motion from anybody in the west Herlock act to make that motion approving the annual report make a motion juan makes a motion i'll second 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 by curtis any further discussion okay all those in favor signify by signify by saying aye aye, aye. any opposed Okay, motion stands approved. Sarah, over to you. I need the same action for East Turlock. So if I could get a motion to approve and your report. I'll move. Thank you, Matt. Second. Second. Thank you, Lacey. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Wonderful. Moving to item number seven, Sigma related update. This is general updates, no action taken. Uh, first bullet is the revisions to the groundwater sustainability plan. Debbie, you want to take the lead on that? Sure. So uh, the consultant team has been working on um, uh, pulling information together to do the analyses. Um, we have a meeting scheduled with uh, the Department of Water Resources on 18th to talk to them about um, a couple of things. One being um, the analysis of uh, the drinking water wells and um, and that that's the, the domestic wells and that, that's one of the, the requirements that we have to kind of analyze where they are and, and um, potential impacts of those. And, uh, and so that um, is, uh, is going to be the concept is to, to talk to BWR about the approach that we're taking to make sure everybody's on the same page with respect to um, data limitations and, and, and what assumptions we're using and that sort of thing. Um, and then the, the, the results of that will be talked about. Um, um, and then, um, uh, the second item is to talk through uh, uh, some of the projects and management actions and our approach to that. And, and that's going to be really focused on um, what um, East Turlock is, is working on with respect to the MLRP and to get clarification on um, how um, the adaptive management approach that we have, you know, where uh, 
what type of changes we need to make to the GSP to um, to be sure that the DWR is is comfortable with an approach where it has commitments to projects and management actions, and then perhaps triggers and um, other things for backstop of the adaptive type portion of it, where if if the project management actions we have commitment to, maybe conditions change or things aren't enough, then triggering the um, maybe other management actions. And so uh, how much certainty they, do they need within that? Are they comfortable with that approach? You know, and talk them through all of that so that we can grasp something that um, will be um, uh, acceptable to, to EWR. Um, so, so are they given the nod or are they kind of just like, well, we'll, we'll consider it kind of like what you brought up at that last meeting where they, uh, you know, they won't give you a definitive nay or yay, right? It, I mean, that... well, they, won't, they won't say absolutely yes or absolutely no, but they were very good in, um, in, in our first meeting in answering the questions that we have. And so I think it's it's important that we can have really good questions to kind of get feedback on um, what their thoughts are. I see you look like questions no okay <laughs> concerns no well, the other thing i want to say i i did we did receive the notice of intent for yeah. updates for the, for the adoption um i had one question regarding that i remember at the last uh there was a sort of tentative schedule set forth with todd groundwater right um and the goals that they had for each month and um i, I forgot the is was it july 1st the, the date that it needed to be completed by? It's on the 16th. Okay. Yeah, and if we're still on track. Well, that's what I was going to say. We're and, on track with, with those uh, dates that we set forth. Woodard and Card um, is, is getting us a more detailed schedule with respect to the project management action section. So the, the uh, modeling and, and all of that. And so we'll be able to share that once, once we get that. Um, they wanted to better understand what all the projects were and what they would need to do in order to be able to refine the schedule to provide, you know, additional milestones, but yes. Does that include the extra modeling that was kind of like the caveat no, sure. where they needed to know, hey, like right off the bat, if we were going to proceed and with that work? We will be doing that. Yeah. And, that just, and then just to follow up, um, again, <laughs> being newer to this tag team, um, I was just wondering if there was anything from the individual agencies that was needed for this GSP adoption or for the process of um, moving forward with the consultants. Um, we have been um, getting information from the individual agencies on the individual projects and so updates. Um, and uh, the individual agencies have provided updates to their individual projects that have fed into the annual report, which will then feed into the GSP update. Um, and so the consultant team um, is now working with all that information, and then they're going to give us some additional acts. And the uh, meeting with DWR on the 18th is going to help inform what specifics we went uh, also need to be able to incorporate into the, the GSP. So thank you for the question. I don't have an exact answer yet. We have what we need right now. But there'll probably be more information that we need, needed to feed into this as we move forward. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, we're also meeting with uh, UWR um, <laughs> on Thursday for um, a brief conversation about the, the, um, the things that we've encountered um, as we've updated the annual report and developed the annual report, one being the subsidence, um, another being uh, uh, a monitoring well um, uh, within the, the city of Turlock where we saw huge swings. And so we started digging into it a little further and found that they were using a, a new piece, piece of equipment and some of the water level the data wasn't quite right. So I, I know that the city of Modesto, they're flushing out a well or something, so, so, but I think that's been captured and it's, you know, to improve water quality. Cause I know that, that, that was brought up with pick with Miguel and Miguel had mentioned that to me. So, you know, hopefully that's captured. 
Say that again. Sorry. So there is a there is a well that the city of Modesto they're flushing and it seemed like excessive, like but it's to improve the water quality. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's for a short period of time, but it's they were like, whoa, that's a lot. That's a lot of water. I mean, yeah. Um, and then um, uh, we'll also be talking about the changes in the reference point elevations um, over in East Turlock as a result of the survey that was done for the the different monitoring wells. So we don't want PWR to read the annual report and discover these things. We'd rather talk to them ahead of time explain to them our approach to addressing those changes um, because we're not allowed to change additional things within the GSP other than what they've asked us to you know, revise. And so we want you know, to be on the same page about how we're approaching this in, in relation to um, the end report as well as the uh, revision GSP. So we're going to be meeting with uh, when you said that you're meeting with DWR, are these people that you're meeting with working very closely with the ones who denied our GSP? Like, are they all on the same page and we're getting the correct information? And how did we not get that ahead of time and this? So, um, yes, but the people that are so so we're we provide an agenda for the meeting, and right. the information that we want to talk about and questions. And then DWR pulls in information, the subject matter experts that would be having to look at it as they're reviewing the DSP so that we're hopefully we're talking to the same people and getting back. Um, again, there's no guarantee that they, you know, will tell you. Well, just, I mean, sometimes when it's at the lower level, I deal with the county and a lot of times I'll get one answer and then someone else isn't sure at all what I'm talking about. And so I want to make sure that... <laughs> we're not having that issue that we're going to think we're on the right path, turn another plan in and say, oh, no, you didn't do this, this, and this. Like, well, <laughs> we would have known that ahead of time and could so have made sure it was there. That's the reason why EWR has said, only revise the things we've asked you to revise okay. because the rest of it they've approved. And if you right. mess with anything else, then they'll have to reassess that. And they, you know, I know that I'm mean, so like the cost. I don't know. Um, maybe I'm only Denaire is a small agency that's concerned with it, but I know that this time with doing the revision, there's obviously extra costs for our consultant team. And from what I understand, it's going to be covered under existing funds, reappropriating some funds. But if something like that happens and there's another cash call and contributions and stuff, like that affects someone small like us, our budget. So I just am trying to make sure my board is wanting to make sure this isn't going to be another. Cash call another. Oh, we didn't do it. Right. We got to submit another one and another one. That's our concern as a small agency. I don't know if anyone else is concerned with it. If anyone else's boards are concerned with it, my board is just trying to figure out how we worked on this for so many years, and it didn't. I try to explain to them that there's a lot of agencies that didn't get it right the first time. It wasn't approved the first time. I couldn't remember the numbers, but I know it was I think less than half that was approved on the first submittal, and that was really what I was able to give my board. Uh, they're just trying to figure out how we worked on this for years and years and years, and it's not <laughs> good enough. So we were close, but but they did have some additional questions. You're right, um, and uh, and and we were we are doing everything we can to get all of the answers that we can from the department to make sure that we're addressing mm. the, the questions, and they're very pointed questions now. Um, earlier on, they also weren't able to provide much feedback on what we were doing there, like what you guys are doing, Jason, mm -hmm. you know, and so until they had a GSP process, they didn't really provide feedback. Yeah, well, I, I think the concern is going to be if every year we're, we're reporting the same thing and nothing's being done, I think that's where they're really going to crack the whip. They're going to come say, hey, you know, I mean, if, if you were to be on calls for other sub basins, and I mean, it, it's an eye opener. It's not just us. Some other places are, are worse off, you know? Like, oh yeah, 100%. Um, but that being said, we have, we have some questions that we have. Just like I said, dealing with some of the agencies that we deal with, we get different answers from different people. I just want to make sure that the meetings that you're having are very, they're, they're working very closely with the people who have denied our GSP. <laughs> so that we're getting the right information to work on. That's all. Yeah, okay. my contact. 
um, with the department is the person who is in charge or that is the section mm -hmm. that that reviews. Okay, perfect. So yeah. even more specific. Good. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I have a board meeting next week, so I want to make sure I give. Yeah, just tell, them, yeah. tell them we got the A team. Yeah, I'll let them know. <laughs> Not the C team. You paid for the A team, right, Liz? <laughs> Sure. I think David struck me is the first two years after the popular GSP was significant drought, right? Of course it was. That's our luck. We turn an annual report universe like hex going on. Yeah. I think the second point that Debbie made right there is like we're throwing everything at this revision so we get it approved. Mm -hmm. The last thing we want is to go into probationary status because then we will yeah. be spending a lot of money. Right. Them to stay waterboard and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I know how much ours is, and I know everyone else is going to be paying. And that's the thing, whatever they say we're going to do in the update, ours is going to hold us too, right? And that's that's fine. You know, we've got to get it done. Awesome. One more thing. Yeah, go ahead, Debbie. Sure. And and that's just to um, remind everyone that uh, we are are finishing up the spring water level measurements. So if you haven't already done them, please do and then send them to the person you normally send them to because we have a couple of contact points that gathers all the information and then um, we send it off to uh, Todd Groundwater or um, the other consultant on um, the east side that um, uh, that does the reporting. And so um, uh, that information will also be helpful as we uh, go about updating the, the GSP. We want to kind of know what um, what this year's water level information informs us of. And then um, also uh, to that, um, we're going to need to come to you folks next month for the authorization to um, evaluate the fall and spring of this last year, water years, um, water level measurements. So we can kind of pull that together and know what we're talking about as we develop um, the revisions. So we'll be looking for that next month. Right. Anything else, Debbie? Or a normal thing on grants, Mike or Sarah, anything on the MLRP or any other grant stuff you're working on? So uh, just probably one update, which is that, um, uh, you know, Formation has had somebody compiling grant information as part of the uh, CV Salts and MPEP program, and we've connected with them, and we're going to see about, you know, getting like a regular update sheet that we can provide, you know, just, uh, it, it, it'll be, you know, broader than just what's of interest under Sigma, but I think it'll be helpful just in terms of screening, you know, and, and I, you know, I know that, that there's folks out there already doing that, this will kind of add to it. It's not lost on me, some of the data gaps we have as we work on the GSP revision, Things that would have been filled had we got the grant the DWR gave us. So let's feel like let's put that in our revision too. Yeah. Like we're trying to do stuff we don't know. We're shooting in the dark because we don't have information because you wouldn't give us the money to figure that out. But. In a nice way that we don't offend them. <laughs> yeah. So and we'll we'll see. But we're getting that. I appreciate everybody's hard work on revisions for the GSP. There's a lot going on. To keep it on track and uh, it's a lot of pressure too it's not a bad thing that's how stuff gets done but um appreciate everybody's hard work i mean like they we're working on revised projects and management action actions a lot more aggressive to address the concerns that um dwr had in a letter about the overdraft and then working on programs to deal with um wells and different things that could sit up upside down if we have a, a longer drought okay anything more on general sigma updates from the group Exciting! We got a new well, or you know, turn off series on the surface water project now. So that's good. Only so the urban pumping is like thirty thousand, and third or half that's going to go away now because of the SOWA project. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Our our uh, our numbers have gone way down in just our uh, the past three months. Groundwater pumping. Yeah, yeah. yeah. From like uh, we were averaging, I believe it was somewhere around. Um, like 50 million gallons um, a month. Okay. Now it's like five to 10. Right. 
Amazing. In, in the in these winter months, it's yeah, winters five anyway, right? Around five to ten, but the the drop was. Well, I could tell because I, I had. I mean, I I have a water system, but when I tested for TDS, it was like four thirty, four forty. Now it's like twenty six. I even yeah. had to test it a second time. I was like, yeah, we had, uh, yeah, we had to call the all the uh, dialysis centers and be like, right. hey, it's the CDS is going down. They're all okay. Yeah. So, well, good, and that's all Western Lower Aquifer stuff. So that. That'll make a difference in Turlock and Siri. So, but good. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay. Hearing nothing. Our next regular meeting of the Joint Technical Technical Advisory Committees is scheduled for Tuesday, April 9th, twenty twenty four, at two p.m. With that, for the West Turlock, I take a motion to adjourn. Moved. A motion by Curtis. We have a second. Second. Second, Mike Pickock. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned at 3.33.